Did Jesus teach cannibalism? Now, this is a very interesting question, and a lot of you guys who are watching this, who are Christian, are going to be going on and saying, what on earth is he talking about? Yes, that's right. When you're on the internet, you literally get asked anything. But this is not too far-fetched of a question, as I'm going to talk a little bit about in this lesson, a study on John chapter 6. Hello, my name is Nathan Faust. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join me on this adventure through John 6. At Faithwise Defenders, we are an apologetic ministry providing answers to your questions and taking on the woke culture. So, let's go ahead and jump right into this lesson like I always do. I always like to be as brief as possible in my introductions so we can get down into the meat of this lecture. So, did Jesus teach cannibalism? This is an analysis of John chapter 6. For many of you veterans of scripture, you know exactly where I'm going with this. And Ultimately, before I really jump into detail and look at the scriptures, uh, in fact, let's go ahead and read it. And John chapter 6, verse 53 through verse 59, it says, So Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you don't have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna your ancestors ate, and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Matthew, uh, John chapter 6, verse 53 through verse 59. Did you know that in early days of Christianity, the Christians were, of course, being persecuted, but there was uh, a lot of dispute on whether or not Christians were participating in various sinful activities. All I want you to do, uh, you can go ahead and pause this video and go on Google and type in, uh, did Christians eat and drink blood. And I'm sure that's all you would have to do for this Google search. And it'll pop up various people in those days that accused Christians of cannibalism. And this was one of the attacks that Christians had to endure in those days. They would say things like, Christians are those people who eat and drink and have incest with each other and of course have relations with their parents and so on and so forth. Uh, Suetonius uh, and Pliny and several others I believe made several accusations similar to this about the Christians and all you have to do is look them up. That's why it's, it's actually a pressing concern to answer this question. Although uh, many people today would not raise such issues like this. I do believe it's very important to look at the problems that Christians had to face and, and how they overcame certain problems in their day. So, did Jesus teach cannibals? What I want to focus on is the context of John chapter 6. And then we're going to be looking at the application. And those are the only two points that we're going to be focusing on in this section of Scripture, the context and the application. 
the context. This is what I want you to think about and ponder about and ask yourself as we begin this journey together through this text. The first question is, what is the flow of the text? What are the heights of the text? What are the valleys of this text? What are the dynamics of this text? That's what I'm really talking about. What are the ebbs and flows, so to speak? Number two, why were they attracted to Jesus in the first place? That's right. As you know, in John chapter 6, Jesus accumulated quite the following at this point in his ministry. And at the end of chapter 6, they all pretty much just deserted him. And so what I want to look at is why were they attracted to Jesus in the first place? And number three, what is the meaning of these verses? What is Jesus really talking about? Is he actually talking about eating and cannibalism, becoming zombies or some sort of vampires in nature? And number four, well, we will we'll see if we can get this far in the amount of time we have, is what was John's purpose for adding this event to his gospel? So those are the four points. What is the flow of the text? Why were they attracted to Jesus in the first place? What is the meaning of the verses? And what was John's purpose for adding this? And this is actually a good outline for you guys to apply to each and every pericope you stumble upon during your own studies. And for those of you who may or may not know, a pericope is a section of scripture. So, let's begin with the outline of John chapter 6. We're getting to understand, to know the feel or the flow of the text. Well, it starts off with Jesus feeding the 5,000 in John chapter 6, verses 1 through verse 15. Okay, so that's one thing. Number two, Jesus walks on the water, all right, 16 through 20. Jesus then teaches on the bread of life, John chapter 6, verse 21 through verse 59, and then they all desert him in the end. And that, and that is the C or conclusion of the chapter. And this is something really important to see, especially for those individuals out there who want to start a ministry. Your days aren't always going to end happily. Your missions aren't always going to end on a happy note. There's going to be some problems. There's going to be some problems in your life. There's going to be ebbs and flows and mountains to climb in your life. And this is, of course, ends on a very sad note on Jesus' ministry on that regard, as far as the people is concerned. But here's the question. Were they really there? with him from the beginning, if they actually deserted him? That's the question that I want you to keep in mind. Sure, it may seem like it's sad, but if you look at the context, if you understand what's really happening, it may not be. The mood of John 6, we're understanding the flow here, Jesus had compassion on the crowd that followed him. Mark 6.34 says they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, I don't know how many of you actually rose sheep or, or had to take care of sheep. Uh, I never did, but I live, uh, when I was younger, I lived close to a farming community. Uh, Hereford, of course, was of quite a farming type community in Texas. And um, I was always told by the farmers that sheep were the dumbest little things you would ever find. And they meant that with compassion in their heart. They, they didn't mean to belittle the sheep, but they were, they were dumb and they were always looking for someone to lead them. And that's pretty interesting how the Bible compares Christians to us people as sheep. And in this case, sheep without a shepherd. Now, the Bible isn't trying to be little, but it seems like 
people in nature always try to rally themselves around somebody and they were looking for somebody i can just visualize this desperate sensational gaze or eyes that these people were having they were downtrodden and they were beaten and they were poor and they were looking for someone they were looking for a guiding light and of course jesus appeared and he had the guiding light and they began to follow him Jesus' compassion turned to a stern warning for the followers, found in John chapter 6, verse 24. It says, When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs. Here's their purpose. All right. Remember, a few moments ago, when we were looking at the outline, here it is. When I said that it's, it kind of ends on a so, sad and sorry note in John chapter 6, verse 60 through verse number 70. But what I want to make, the point that I want to make is that was it really sorrowful at the end? It took on a sour note in the middle of the story or in the beginning of the story it says but because you ate the loaves and were filled so jesus saying you weren't following me because of the signs you weren't following me because of the miracles that i did you were following me because you guys were hungry you guys wanted food and he said to them don't work for the food that perishes well, for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. And this, right here, sets the stage for Jesus to say, I am the bread of life. This right here, this purpose, this fact that they were just following him to fill their bellies so the question is were they following him because they loved him did they follow him because they had an honest earnest zeal to hear his uh, lessons and teachings and apply to their lives scripture says they were after him because they wanted to be filled and that's why Jesus gave this stern warning to them so the mood of the text, Jesus continues to teach them, John chapter 6, verse 26 through verse 51. The crowd becomes frustrated. Why? Because, in John chapter 6, verse 60, why does the crowd become frustrated? Because they couldn't understand it. He said, this is a hard saying. My friends, the word of God is hard. We're going to have to rebuke. We're going to have to reprove, as the Apostle Paul says. And the Word of God is not always flowers. There's a lot of beautiful things in the Word of God. There's a lot of wonderful things in the Word of God. But there's going to be some things in here that's going to cause individuals to desert you, to leave you, and to get frustrated. And so the crowd leaves them. I want to look at some of the words now, and let, let's delve deep and see whether or not Jesus was teaching cannibalism. Jesus identifies himself as the bread of life, and we see the context now, don't we? We see why he said that. And it says, I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. I am the bread of life. And we see that in John 6, 35, John 6, 41, 48, and 51. So Jesus says he's the bread of life. What about this bread? What does it mean? Well, bread represents God's provision. So write this down, okay? So when you see bread, bread is sustenance, bread is food. It also represents God's providing for his people. We see this in the manna from heaven in Exodus chapter 16, verses 
uh, four and five that was supposed to be, not five through four. Four through five, manna from heaven, Exodus chapter 16. We also see this from the table of showbread, Exodus chapter 25, 23, 30, and so on and so forth. God's ultimate provision for his people. The bread, the manna, what does it represent? God is going to take care of his people. Fulfilling Matthew 6, verse 33, right? So Jesus said, you're going to have all this stuff. All you have to do is seek the kingdom of God first. That was the story. That was the point of the manna, the bread. He says, you don't have to worry. You follow me to the very end, and I'll take good care of you. He takes care of the birds of the field, correct? You are much more than they are. Why? Because you are made in God's image, the Imago Dei, Genesis chapter 1. So God will provide for you. That's the promise that the bread symbolizes. So what is the meaning of the example? Well, that means we are provided for in a spiritual sense through Jesus Christ. It is through Jesus that we have life and have it abundantly. It is through Jesus that he provides truth. It is through Jesus that God provides for our needs, our spiritual needs. It's through Jesus that we have salvation. John 3, verse 16. 1 John 2, verse 2, one of my favorites. 1 John 2, verse 2. It is through Jesus that we have access to God, of course, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 5. He is the mediator between God and man. Why? Because in Isaiah chapter 59, it says sin separates us from God. So the purpose of Jesus was to reunite us with God and, of course, fortify the relationship. So we are provided for through Jesus Christ. So flesh, blood, eating, drinking, and feeding. What are these words? When you do a word study of John chapter 6, verse 15 onward, you're going to come across these words. Flesh, blood, eating, drinking, and feeding. What does eating, drinking, and feeding mean? It means spiritual assimilation. Think about it. When we eat something, when we consume something, that something becomes a part of us. If you eat a hamburger, that hamburger is going to become a part of you. If you eat anything, if you drink anything, it becomes a part of you. So there's a sense, then, of this spiritual assimilation. If you eat Jesus, if you partake of him, then you become a assimilated with him. He becomes a part of you in a sense. And this isn't actually talking about the physical of eating the Eucharist or eating the communion and then you get this special power of becoming one with Jesus. No. What this is really referring to is that when one follows Jesus, when one follows his commands, when one studies the Bible, when one's a good student of God's word, when they try their best to live a good life for Jesus. Then they become assimilated. A spiritual assimilation takes place. This, of course, goes back to the Passover. Um, and, of course, it has some connections, of course, to the Eucharist, as we know later on. Um, Jesus is going to say pretty much similar things about the Last Supper and the Passover. And this is a Christological meaning. So, not going to get too much involved in that, but know this, it's a spiritual assimilation. When, when it says eating, drinking, and feeding, we are technically assimilating ourselves and becoming one with Jesus. And this is all spiritual. It's nothing. It's nothing. It has nothing to do with the wafer. It has nothing to do with the wine or the juice that you drink. It's all a spiritual ising of the situation. Remember, it goes all the way back. If I just flip back here to John chapter 6, verse 24. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got in the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. 
When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus said, Truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and are filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternity. Now, is there a food, is there an apple out there that can fill you for eternity? Let me know. Because there's no such thing as that. So this is a spiritualizing of the situation. So, essentially Jesus was speaking metaphorically. Now, we go to our fourth and final point. What was John's purpose for adding this into his gospel? Well, to speak of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If you look throughout John's gospel, this is an extremely powerful point that John is trying to get. And this is the reason why many of the scholars like Dr. Bart D. Ehrman, Dr. James Tabor, Dr. Robin Faith Walsh, I think that's how you say her name, W-A-L-S-H. If I said that wrong, please inform me in my comments because I want to be corrected if I'm wrong. And all these other type of supposed liberal scholars are trying to undermine they're trying to attack, they're trying to defile, they're trying to assault the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's why they always like to pick on John's Gospel. So that is John's point. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. It is through Him that we have eternal life and are provided for. So what is the application? If we take on Christ, if we take on Jesus and spiritually assimilate his essence, then we have life. How can we do that? By reading the word of God. By studying it, by enjoying it, and by becoming serious practitioners of his teaching. That's a beautiful, isn't it? I think so. It's absolutely gorgeous uh, point, a gorgeous lesson for us found in this particular uh, story and this example here. All right. Without further ado, thank you for joining, and I hope to see you next time. And remember, be arduous students of God's Word.